Hello, and welcome to Healthcare Cybersecurity Update, ensuring HIPAA compliance and cloud services. I'm Carol Fly with High Take Answers, a site in the Answers Media Network, and we're back again for another thought leadership event with EFAX Corporate. Today, we're pleased to have Brad Spambauer and David Hold presenting. Brad Spambauer is the Senior Director of Product Development at EFEX Corporate and is also the HIPAA Privacy Officer for J2 Cloud Services. He is responsible for product strategy and operations for the EFEX Corporate suite of solutions. David Hold is the Senior Product Marketing Manager at J2 Cloud Services, Inc. and is responsible for the go-to-market strategies for the EFEX Corporate suite of solutions. Um. On today's agenda, Brad and David will be discussing the present state of healthcare cybersecurity, the latest stats on data breaches and HIPAA violations, HSS OCR audit program and enforcement actions, cloud service providers and HIPAA compliance, cyber hacking, data breaches, and ransomware, HIPAA standard on encryption and integrity, comments, compliance, and security pitfalls, eight places your EPHI might be hiding, and how cloud faxing is more secure and compliant. Following this agenda, we will have a brief Q&A with Brad and David. And now here is David Hold. Before we launch into our discussion, a little housekeeping. Please take a moment to read the disclaimer on the screen. Basically what it says is, we are not lawyers and nothing in this presentation should be construed as legal or professional advice with respect to regulatory compliance. Also, at the top right corner of your screen, you will see a Q&A box that you can use to submit questions at any time during the presentation. Time permitting, we will endeavor to answer your questions during the Q&A period at the end. There is also a resource folder at the bottom of the screen that, tank, that contains links to related information. Finally, all registrants will receive a copy of the webinar presentation deck and recording for future reference. And now, let's get started. We'll begin by looking at the cyber threats facing healthcare providers today. Now, clearly, the healthcare industry in 2017 is a prime target of cyber criminals. Why? Because healthcare records, known as protected healthcare information, or PHI, command 10 to 20 times the value of credit card data. For example, the market price on the dark web for credit card numbers ranges from $0.50 cents to $5 per number. In contrast, the market price for PHI, or ePHI when it's in electronic format, can range from 10 to $50 per record. So there is a strong financial incentive to target systems containing large numbers of healthcare account records. Here's a couple of things to consider. Credit cards can be immediately canceled. Account numbers can be easily changed. But PHI, personal names, social security numbers, etc., those are permanent in the sense that they are with you your whole life, and they're not easily altered, which adds to their value. Here are some statistics on cybersecurity and HIPAA compliance in healthcare over the past year. On the left, you will see some highlights of metrics collected by the Identity Theft Resource Center. As you can see, healthcare, as a single industry, accounted for about a third of all data breaches across all industries and government that were reported last year. And the percentage of records breached was even higher, although this could be reflective of the HIPAA re uh, reporting requirements that other industries do not have to obey. Still, 16 million records, that's a lot of records. On the right are compilations of all complaints and investigations by the Office of Civil Rights within the Department of Health and Human Services since the program began. The Office of Civil Rights, or OCR, is responsible for HIPAA compliance and enforcement. And this shows that more than 144,000 complaints have been received and 97% have been resolved. Of those, 24,617 cases, or 17%, required some form of corrective action. The OCR also maintains a list on their website detailing all breaches of patient medical records affecting more than 500 individuals. There have been 1,688 reports of large breaches of PHI to date. Note also that while there are only 41 cases that resulted in civil money penalties, at least so far, they produced over 48 million, or more than a million dollars per settlement on average. 
And that $48 million is important for another reason that may not be immediately apparent. The audit program is, by necessity, self-funding, which means that these funds will be used to investigate more complaints, resulting in more penalties, and so on. And 589 criminal referrals have been sent to the Department of Justice for investigation. The OCR's enforcement program has also been ramped up in the past year with a record number of settlements and corrective action plans. For example, Phase 2 of the audit program that began last year will double the number of audits to between 200 and 250. And, for the first time, business associates of healthcare-covered entities are included in the audit program, which expands the coverage beyond traditional healthcare providers to a wide range of companies, including cloud service providers. And we'll have more to say about compliance in the cloud a little later. According to Devin Mag According to Devin McGraw, Deputy Director, Health Information Privacy, there are two types of audit, desk audit of submitted documentation and on-site audits. Most are desk audits. A small number will warrant further investigation at the customer premises. The desk audit started in the fall of 2016, and the on-site audits will take place in 2017. Purpose of the audits are to examine the mechanisms of compliance, identify best practices, discover risks and vulnerabilities, and basically try to spot problem areas before they turn into breaches or disclosures of PHI. The stated goal of the audit program is to develop tools and guidance that will assist healthcare providers improve compliance. Candidates for audit are selected from a pool of providers consisting of hospitals and health systems, physician practices, skilled nursing facilities, and pharmacies. This year, the program expands to include business associates for the first time. About 20,000 BAs have been identified to OCR by their covered entities. The plan is to audit up to 200 BAs. And the cloud service providers are now considered to be BAs under certain circumstances, which we'll talk about later. For the business associates, the audits will evaluate compliance with seven controls drawn from the security rule, the privacy rule, and the breach notification rule. And here's how the process works. If you get a notice of audit and documentation request in the, in the mail, you must respond within 10 days. The idea is that if you're doing what you should be doing, the documentation will be easy to acquire. You will need to document ap applicable policies, procedures, and evidence of implementation. Documents must be complete and relevant, but don't do a data dump of everything because there's a 10 megabyte limit for submission and a 10 meg file is not that large. Finally, it's very important to cooperate and don't ignore requests for information because they can open a compliance re review for any reason whatsoever. For example, if they see something in an audit that leads them to believe there is a significant risk to PHI, or if, if their request for documentation is ignored, and they don't like to be ignored. In addition to the audit program, OCR also investigates complaints and reported data breaches. So let's take a close look at several of the more important breaches of PHI that resulted in significant penalties to see what lessons we can learn. First, I should point out that although a data breach obviously puts at risk the patients whose personal information is stolen, there are serious consequences to the health provider itself. One of these is negative publicity and the tremendous damage it can do to the provider's credibility and trust with patients. Another major consequence of a breach is the potential for direct fines and penalties, which the HHS's Office of Civil Rights can place on the healthcare provider. And here are some of the biggest of those in recent times, as well as one of the smallest. First, the biggest fine in the history of HIPAA was a claim against Advocate Healthcare Network, Illinois' largest healthcare system. The healthcare provider will have to pay 5.55 million in fines and adopt the corrective action plan for safeguarding EPHI. This is the single largest penalty levied to date against a single entity for a HIPAA violation. According to the settlement, HHS began investigating in 2013 based on three separate breach notification reports, beginning with an unencrypted laptop that was left in an unlocked car overnight. The size of the fine is based on the size of the breach, about 4 million patient records, and the egregiousness of the noncompliance, and of course, the depth of their pockets, because it's not OCR's intention to drive 
every company out of business, although that has happened. I should note that larger breaches have occurred in the past that are still being investigated, so expect, we can expect more fines in the future. And to summarize what went wrong at Advocate, the HIPAA privacy rule, security rule, and breach notification rules were all violated. In particular, the OCR found that they f failed to perform a risk analysis. They failed to take corrective action. They failed to implement access controls. They failed to get a signed BAA or business associate agreement, and they failed to encrypt a laptop that was left in an unlocked car overnight. The result? An enormous fine that Advocate now has to pay to the feds. Next, a settlement with the University of Mississippi that cost $2.75 million. The issue started, once again, with a lost laptop affecting 10,000 individuals. Investigators also found 67,000 files on a shared network drive accessible to anyone with a generic name and password. Of the lessons learned, one of them is that they need to do a much better job of controlling access to systems and networks and also to notify individuals that their data was breached. And now for the smallest fine. So you're probably wondering, what's the point of a $25,000 fine against a little physical therapy outfit? What terrible crime did they commit? All they did was post some testimonials and pics of happy and satisfied customers on the website. And I suspect a lot of people have done that. But they failed to get written authorization from the clients before they posted the information. And that is a violation of the HIPAA privacy rules. And somebody complained. And all it takes is one complaint. There's a lesson here for everyone, because the point the OCR was trying to make is no company is too big or too small to escape compliance enforcement. I'll repeat that quote, which comes directly from the director of the Office for Civil Rights. No company is too big or too slow or too small to escape compliance enforcement, and all it takes is one complaint. With that in mind, here are three more that I am including because the settlements offer insights into the kinds of issues the OCR is looking at. First, St. Joseph's, a hospital system in California and the Southwest, had to pay a $2.14 million penalty. In this case, EPH files were freely available online and accessible by search engines from 2011 through 2014. 38,000 or 31,800 individual medical records were exposed. The cause, default file sharing on the server provided open access to anyone on the Internet, and nobody noticed for years. The lesson here is turn off default file sharing when installing a new server. There's actually more to it than that because the OCR noted that even though St. Joe's had hired contractors to assess risks and vulnerabilities to EPHI, they failed to conduct a proper enterprise-wide risk analysis including the impact resulting from a change in technology when installing the new th servers. The remedy imposed by OCR was to implement a corrective action plan, including enterprise-wide risk analysis and risk management plan, revising policies and procedures accordingly, train employees, and provide regular reports to OCR. Next up, Oregon State University Health Services received a $2.7 million penalty. In this case, the university had given a cloud service provider access to EPHI from 3,000 patients without having a BAA, or Business Associate, agreement in place. The investigators found a patchwork of risk analysis in various departments, but no enterprise-wide plan. In short, they did not do what was necessary to manage the risk. And most telling, there was no encryption of patient data, and as so often happens, unencrypted laptops and thumb drives were stolen. Now, this last one is interesting because it was the first to involve a business associate of a co covered entity. In this case, Catholic Healthcare of Philadelphia acted as a business associate by providing information technology services and management to six skilled nursing facilities. The fine was only $650,000, reflecting the fact that this was a nonprofit without really deep pockets. But that's still a lot of money for an organization dedicated to helping low-income, elderly, and indigent patients. And as it all started, as they often do, with a report of a stolen cell phone containing unencrypted PHI. To the government investigators, that report was the proverbial canary in the coal mine. And such incidents often turn out to be the tip of the iceberg to a lot more hiding beneath the surface. 
They found there were no policies governing removal of devices containing PHI and no security incident plan. In fact, there was no risk analysis or risk management plan at all. So now let's move on to the cloud and take a closer look at the subject of cloud service providers, or CSPs for short. For a long time, there was a long-standing perception in the healthcare community that cloud services were not HIPAA compliant, but that is no longer true. A HIMSS analytics study found that more than 80% were already using cloud services and headed towards 90% mostly for software as a service and cloud storage, backup, and recovery. A significant percentage also outsource communication services to the cloud. The question now is whether or not your cloud provider needs to sign a BAA, or Business Associate Agreement. Well, according to a recently released guidance from the OCR on cloud service providers, the rule is if you create, maintain, receive, or transmit EPHI, you'll need to have a BA with a covered entity that is providing the EPHI. In the view of the OCR, CSPs are usually not conduits because they typically store EPHI on more than a temporary basis. Maintenance of this data is said to be prolonged. That said, the conduit exception rule still applies if the, all the provider does is transmit information from point A to point B with minimal processing and no long-term storage. However, when a cloud provider stores and or processes EPHI on behalf of a covered entity or business associate, that CSP is a BA. And it does, so I hope that clears up when a CSP needs to sign a BAA. Another point to consider is that the covered entity can be held responsible for the acts of the business associate, and that is true regardless of whether or not they have a signed BAA. That is known as vicarious responsibility. So covered entities, therefore, need to ensure that their cloud service providers are fully in compliance by requesting a service level agreement, or SLA, from the cloud provider, and additionally, they should get verification of compliance from a third party. Likewise, if a, if a cloud provider discovers that a customer is using its cloud service to store or maintain EPHI, the cloud provider must must either enter into a BAA or destroy the information. And that was one of the problems at the Oregon Health and Science University case, in which case the covered entity did not secure a business uh, associate agreement with the cloud service provider before granting access to the patient's PHI. Turning now to the most common sources of data breaches, uh, this chart is pretty self-explanatory. A couple of points are worth noting. Theft and loss of devices account for most of the reported inc incidents, or 53%. Theft and loss, so if you're putting EPHI on removable devices, expect them to get lost or stolen and plan accordingly. Two, if this chart were based on the total number of individuals affected, almost the entire chart would be blue because it's cyber hacking that affects the vast majority of records breached and individuals affected. So theft and loss account for most of the breaches, but hacking, which is only 13% of incidents, produces the really big numbers in terms of records stolen. Now let's take a closer look at one type of cyber hacking, ransomware. In a high profile case, MedStar, the second largest health system in Maryland was the victim of a ransomware attack in 2016. This is a newer type of cyber hack in which the hackers download software, usually through a phishing scheme that encrypts an organization's data and systems, effectively locking them out of their own network, and then demand a ransom payment in exchange for a key that will unlock the encryption. With MedStar's ransomware attack, the hackers effectively shut out the entire staff out of their data network. As hospital administrators later explained it, this attack left the system's 30,000 employees and 6,000 doctors having to record and share patient information with pen and paper. So this is more than just a financial crime since it degrades the ability to adequately treat patients. And the OCR recently released guidance on ransomware that explains what is required, required under HIPAA and to help organizations prevent, detect, contain, and respond to this type of threat. With regard to ransomware, there are several key questions you need to ask. Is ransomware a breach? Does it trigger breach reporting? What is the probability that e 
PHI has been compromised. Hint, if you implemented encryption prior to the attack, that probability would be low. Now, I know that many of you would argue that ePHI was not stolen or disclosed during one of these attacks, but you were just blocked from accessing it. So the question is, if access to PHI is affected or prevented, does that constitute a breach? Well, the OCR would say the answer is yes. Remember, under HIPAA, individuals have the right to access their PHI on demand. If you can't access their medical records when requested, you can't be in compliance. Now, advice from all the experts is don't pay ransomware. That just encourages more attacks. And they point out if your data is mirrored to a backup data center, you won't have to. The best response is to be prepared in advance. Remember, the security rule requires contingency planning. It can make a huge difference depending on whether or not you are prepared with good data backup and have practiced recovering that data. Good preparation can get you back up and running in a much shorter time and with less disruption to your quality of care. Cyber hacking can also result in significant economic impacts in other ways, as detailed in the Cisco Cybersecurity Survey. The numbers speak for themselves, with around 40% of companies that experienced a data breach facing significant losses in business opportunities, revenues, and customers. Then there's the impact of negative publicity that can cause long-term damage to an organization's reputation in the community. Okay, so we've established that cyber attacks represent a major threat to the entire industry and to healthcare in particular, and that it's on the rise. Now let's discuss the what of cybercrime. What are the top concerns of IT security professionals charged with preventing data breaches and loss of PHI? Thousands of the IT security pros who participated in Cisco's third annual security capabilities benchmark study cited the following elements of having the highest risk of cyber attack. Mobile devices, public cloud, public or cloud infrastructure, and user behavior. Now this is understandable. The proliferation of mobile devices creates more endpoints to protect. And you'll notice that the cloud was mentioned twice. And that's because the uptake of cloud services is expanding the security perimeter outside the traditional corporate premises. As businesses embrace further digitization and the internet of everything begins to take shape, defenders will have even more to worry about. The attack service will only expand, giving adversaries more space in which to operate. And users are, and always have been, the weak link in the security chain. Thanks, David. And in a moment, I will discuss the HIPAA law and how it relates to healthcare security. But first, I want to underscore an important point about regulatory compliance in general. Compliance and security are two very different initiatives. Bringing your organization into compliance with HIPAA guidelines is certainly one component of an overall approach to protecting ePHI. But securing your company's data requires a lot more than simply complying with HIPAA. That's because HIPAA doesn't and can't address every possible type of breach or attack. While the HIPAA law has been amended and updated several times in its history, the law remains mostly static. Cyber criminals, however are evolving and growing more sophisticated and trying new techniques virtually every day. So while it's essential that your healthcare organization bring its data practices into compliance with HIPAA, and while those measures can help bolster your overall security, it's better to think of HIPAA compliance as the baseline or starting point for your data security and build from there. And with that caveat, let's get into a discussion of specific HIPAA requirements and how they relate to PHI security. It's worth pointing out here that one reason it's so difficult for covered entities and their business associates to know if they're truly in compliance with HIPAA is the way that the law is written. HIPAA's language is intentionally vague, leaving room for interpretation by the businesses regulated under the law. For example, you can see here that the primary rules governing ePHI data protection calls for ensuring confidentiality and protecting against reasonably anticipated threats and that your organization use any security measures that comply. 
The explanation of why regulators have left the text open to interpretation is that technology will change over time and it will often change quite rapidly. But it also means that unless you're a HIPAA or compliance expert, you really should be engaging the services of those who are. Also, one other tip here. If you plan to go it alone in bringing your company into HIPAA compliance, the law breaks its rules for, for compliance into two types, required and addressable. We recommend that wherever, the law, wherever in the law you see addressable, you take no chances and treat that clause as required. Don't take any chances with federal regulators or risk a HIPAA compliance review. Another way HIPAA breaks out its demands for maintaining the security of EPHI in transit is with these two transmission requirements. First, there's the EPHI encryption rule, which, which requires that a covered entity or business associate guard EPHI with sufficient encryption to ensure that it's not stolen in transmission. Second, there's the EPHI integrity rule, which demands that the data is protected in transit such that it can't be modified in transmission. Still, we have the open question, is encryption a requirement for HIPAA compliance? The bottom line is that the security rule doesn't expressly mandate encryption or the type of encryption to be used. But if your risk analysis and risk management plan determines that encryption is a reasonable and appropriate measure to protect your EPHI, it's your responsibility to implement the correct encryption protocols. And when the top government official responsible for HIPAA compliance that is, says that encryption is the gold standard for protecting EPHI, it just makes good sense to encrypt all protected information. And that goes double for any devices that are portable, laptops, flash drives, smartphones, etc., since those devices are bound to go missing sooner or later. One final note about this. The rule also states that if you don't implement encryption, you must document the reason behind this decision and also what alternative measures you took, if any, to protect this data. However, that raises the question of what happens if the covered entity chooses not to encrypt customer data and it's later stolen or otherwise compromised. Here's what Ileana Peters, Senior Advisor for Compliance and Enforcement at the OCR had to say about encryption. She says, the term addressable simply means that it's a baseline. You should be encrypting and you should be implementing good security controls. However, if you choose not to encrypt and you have a breach, we are going to ask you for the documentation on the reasonable compensating controls that you implemented to secure your data. So let me repeat that. You will need to provide the OCR with the documentation on the reasonable compensating controls that you implemented in place of encryption. On the other hand, if the lost data was fully encrypted, you would not even have to report a breach of encrypted data. That's because encryption of EPHI creates a safe harbor from the breach notification requirement. So while we've discussed the fact that the HIPAA security rule doesn't give the how of encryption, the federal government has embraced the encryption standards set by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Regarding encryption of EPHI transmissions, there are two important factors to consider, data that's at rest and data that's in motion. NIST has three publications that describe encryption methods for data at rest and data in motion. The link to these will be included at the end of this presentation. First, let's start with data in motion, or transmission of EPHI. TLS encryption, also known as transport layer security, is the latest standard for encrypting communications across the Internet. It's designed to prevent interception of sensitive information tampering and message forgery, for example, like a man-in-the-middle attack. It's important to note here that SSL, or Secure Socket Layer, the TLS predecessor, is known to be vulnerable to these types of cyber attacks. In such attacks, the cyber criminal in the middle can grab the data being transmitted and modify it without either party even knowing it. Sender and recipient think they're engaged in a confidential communication, but in reality, there's a malicious third party modifying that communication. TLS ensures that both sides of a communication know that the other side is authentic, and this is critical to the security and integrity of data. The current most updated version of TLS is 1.2, as noted above, and that is the version currently supported by EFAX Corporate. That's important because not all cloud providers are using this, and some are still using the dated SSL. So this is a good example of where we benefit from the HIPAA rule not demanding specific technologies or protocols, 
because today's covered entities have better encryption protocol, TLS, to protect against EPHI being modified in transit than they did when the law was written, which was SSL. Second, let's talk about data at rest. Any PHI that's stored on a device or in the cloud should be encrypted as a best practice. NIST recommends AES 256-bit encryption for this data. AES is the NIST encryption standard commonly used with TLS across the Internet. Data is encrypted using a 256-bit encrypt encryption key. This encryption is critical in EPHI. There's also a clear regulatory advantage to encrypting all PHI, including data at rest. As a guidance from the Secretary of Health and Human Services, has, Human Services has stated, if protected health information is encrypted pursuant to this guidance, then no breach notification is required following an impermissible use or disclosure of that information. And as we have seen, too many healthcare organizations could have saved themselves millions of dollars in penalties if they had only encrypted the data on those laptops and those devices. If they had encrypted the data, they would not have needed to report the theft of those devices. It's worth pointing out here that the OCR is seeing a recurring problem with risk analysis and management, which is required under the HIPAA security rules. So let's look at what HIPAA requires with respect to, to risk analysis. The rule requires covered entities to conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of potential risks and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI. Risk analysis must identify all EPHI that's created, maintained, received, or transmitted. Remember those terms because if you create, maintain, receive, or transmit EPHI, then you are responsible for protecting it. Your analysis should assess who will have access to EPHI, on what devices, and from where, and also what will happen at the end of life of that data. How will it be disposed of? The risk analysis also needs to consider each of the following categories. Applications, like EHR and billing systems. Computers and servers. These are both physical, virtual, or cloud-based. Medical devices, including monitoring and imaging. Messaging apps for email and text mobile devices like tablets, smartphones, or even digital cameras, and media such as tape backup or removable storage. And one last thing to remember, risk analysis is not one and done. Rather, it's an ongoing process. For example, anytime you make a change or implement a new application or system, you need to evaluate the risk posed by that change. And finally, after the risk analysis, identify steps, uh, you need to identify steps that should be taken to protect your data. It's very important that you actually implement these steps within a meaningful, a meaningful time period. That is where the risk management rule comes in. The rule requires the implementation of security measures sufficient to, to reduce the risks and vulnerabilities to a reasonable and appropriate level. OCR investigations have uncovered several instance, instances of where an organization identified risks and vulnerabilities and then failed to do anything about it. In fact, one of the most recent and largest fines went to Children's Medical Center of Dallas, Texas, which twice lost devices containing unsecured EPHI records. Although the data breach was investigated and guidance was given, the hospital failed to implement the steps necessary to protect their EPHI. The result? A $3.2 million penalty. Okay, now that we've discussed what HIPAA has to say about securing your EPHI and what could happen if you don't, Let's look at some of the many ways that the covered entities and their business associates actually access and share this data. As you'll see, your organization's defense against data breaches works only to the extent that your IT team actually has its arms around all of the data. In other words, you need to know all of the places where your EPHI resides and how it is being viewed, stored, and shared. Otherwise, you can't fully protect it. Today, your employees are accessing and sharing corporate data from many applications on many devices and often in locations outside of your network's firewall. A doctor viewing a patient record online from home or an admin emailing EPHI to an insurance company from Starbucks are not uncommon scenarios. With that in mind, let's look at a few places your EPHI might be hiding. For starters, your USB drives. Even for a security-conscious healthcare IT team, 
It's easy to forget that USB drives and other portable storage devices exist, but your staff might be using them to transfer documents from a device in the office to a device at home. For your doctors or administrative staff, this might be completely innocent. But as far as HIPAA regulators are concerned, these innocent intentions won't protect your patients. The OCR's position on portable devices is clear. You need to understand the risk to your data and how you're going to mitigate those risks. You need to realize that if you place EPHI on movable devices, it will walk away and be stolen. And encryption is the best defense in that case. If you report a lost, lost thumb drive, smartphone, or laptop containing unencrypted patient records, that sends up a red flag that could put you on the short list for a compliance investigation. Second, text messages. Because it's such a convenient method of communication, healthcare professionals often use text messaging to communicate with colleagues and patients. There are two problems here. First, under most circumstances, texting EPHI on an unsecured device or app is a HIPAA violation. Second, and equally important, texting EPHI can leave the data exposed to hackers. For example, if your staff is texting EPHI over a public Wi-Fi hotspot. Also, what if a doctor or a nurse texting EPHI with their cell phone loses that phone or has it stolen? And maybe they turned off password protection because it wasn't convenient. Theft and loss of unsecured mobile devices is one of the top causes of data breaches investigated by OCR. Third, email accounts. Your IT department may have implemented a secure mail system that satisfies, satisfies HIPAA's requirements. But those closed email systems can only be used among employees and partners who are on the same network. And remember that if your staff probably also sends and receives work-related emails, including EPHI, on non-secure email systems. Often, your doctors or administrative staff will do this for convenience. Perhaps they're in a location where they can't access or use the corporate email. Other times, they might simply forget which email program they're using when they send messages uh, to, from or to a smartphone. So assume your employees will use unencrypted or personal email accounts to send and receive messages containing EPHI unless you have implemented clear policies and safeguards to prevent them from from doing so. Fourth, the hard drive on your standard office equipment, like copiers or fax machines. When your employees scan, copy, or fax physical documents, digital copies of those documents are saved to the hard drives of the copiers, scanners, and fax machines that you use. This is often overlooked as a security vulnerability, and even seasoned IT professionals can forget that this equipment has hard drives. In fact, one health insurance provider was forced to pay $1.2 million in a HIPAA fine for returning leased office equipment that still had stored patient records and other EPHI on the device's hard drives. So you'll need to have strict policies on how to properly sanitize data storage systems that are being retired. Let me run through a few more EPHI hiding spots. Number five, your voice files and recordings. Let's say a patient leaves a voicemail on your organization's phone service or on the smartphone issued to one of your doctors. If the patient identifies herself and gives any personal information in that voicemail, that is considered PHI. Or the doctor may use a voice dictation system or even their smartphone to record patient memos. Again, these voice recordings will qualify as EPHI and they need to be protected. Number six, your previous EMR system after you've migrated to a new one. This is a very common scenario in healthcare today. A doctor's office decides to switch its electronic health records to a new vendor. After training its staff and migrating its records over to the new system, the company will then often maintain a computer that contains copies of all its old records. But few companies will also provide adequate security for that old EHR data, even though it, it is still EPHI and it's subject to the same HIPAA regulations as the new patient data. It's easy to forget this data is even there, but if HIPAA auditors come knocking, you're likely at risk of noncompliance. Number seven, your medical equipment hard drives. So this is often overlooked, but can leave your healthcare organization at risk for both a data breach and landing on the wrong side of a HIPAA investigation. The CT scanner, MRI machine, dental x-ray device, and other medical equipment in your office, they also have hard drives. And virtually all of the images and data stored on these hard drives is by definition, you guessed it, EPHI. 
you need to implement a process for controlling access to these storage drives, encrypting the content, and regularly offloading the data to a secure server. And don't forget about paper records, because there are enough thefts of paper records for that to also be a source of concern. And number eight, ePHI held by third-party providers. To function as a healthcare organization today, you almost certainly need to work with third parties, such as a cloud provider, to back up and recover your data. But these are yet more examples of places where your ePHI is residing and where it also needs protecting. Any vendor that handles your ePHI should be able to demonstrate that they understand HIPAA's requirements and that they have developed HIPAA-compliant processes to secure your data at all times. As noted before, a business associate agreement is required in these cases. Okay, now I'd like to discuss a few very common ePHI transmission technologies in healthcare. Faxing, which many of, in the healthcare world have always assumed was safe and reliable as a means of communication. So there's a widespread and long-standing perception in the healthcare community that traditional analog faxing is intrinsically HIPAA compliant and therefore safe to use. Yes, it's true that traditional fax transmission is reasonably secure because it goes over the public switch telephone network and not the internet. And thanks to the conduit exception rule, this type of fax does not require encryption to be compliant. But fax is only secure during the actual transmission phase over the telephone network. And as this humorous example shows, it's who's at the other end that counts. In fact, there are, in fact, many potential HIPAA compliance pitfalls with traditional fax machines. For example, that fingering a fax number, it's a common source of complaints to the OCR. If, you're fax, if you fax PHI to an unauthorized recipient, you've just committed committed a HIPAA violation. It doesn't matter if it was done by mistake. Documents containing PHI may be left unattended on the machine where they could be vulnerable to unauthorized viewers. And if you don't have a written policy that specifies a set of procedures to secure fax PHI, PHI both ends, then you're not in compliance. Here is a real-world example of how simple things could go very wrong with traditional fax machines. And if you still think that your traditional faxes are secure from end to end, I suggest you ask, ask your staff the following questions. Where is the fax going? Do you have a current BAA with the recipient organization? Who will receive the fax? Are they authorized to view PHI? Is the fax terminal in a secure location? Is everyone who has access to that area authorized to view PHI? And how do you know? Have you been there? Do you always add a confidential cover sheet to, to the top of a fax to prevent prying eyes from viewing patient confidential data? All good questions. And now consider that, that cloud-based fax by email, which goes from desktop to desktop and email inbox to email inbox, and is fully encrypted during transmission, is inherently more secure than traditional analog fax. Next, I'd like to explain in more detail about how that works. When you research the many reported breaches in healthcare involving traditional faxes using fax machines, fax servers, paper faxes, etc., you will find that accidental access by unintended or unauthorized recipients is a common cause of reportable offense, reportable events that could result in an investigation. After your security risk analysis, if you're using outdated fax technology, you may find a lack of audit controls and incomplete logs of ePHI transmissions. You may find that fax machines or multifunction printers are located in common areas. And you may have a lack of access control to private areas with fax machines or fax servers. Security vulnerabilities like these are why so many businesses are moving from a physical fax infrastructure to a hosted cloud fax model. Here I've listed some of the major benefits of cloud faxing for businesses, particularly in healthcare. Using the eFax corporate solution, you can bring your faxing and processing in line with HIPAA. You know that you're sending and receiving faxes with the most advanced fax encryption measures, that's TLS 1.2 and AES 2.56, while they're in transit and while they're stored in the cloud on our secure servers. You'll also have a clear audit trail for record keeping and compliance purposes. 
In addition, J2 Global, the parent company of EFAX Corporate, is willing and able to sign business associate agreements with our healthcare customers, which demonstrates our commitment to your customers' privacy and security. So this diagram shows how an e-fax is sent as an encrypted email attachment and delivered as a regular fax, and vice versa when inbound faxes are delivered as email attachments to and from your desktop computer or private portal. And just a few final facts about e-fax corporate. We have millions of customers worldwide who send millions of faxes every day. We have multiple patents on cloud and fax technology. We're a public company with a market cap of over $4 billion, and we've had steady reoccurring revenue growth over the last 21 quarters. And now with that small sales pitch out of the way, and as we mentioned earlier, here are some helpful resource links for your reference. Uh, we will enclose these links in the slides that are sent to you after our webinar. Now let's hand it back to Carol for our Q&A session so we can answer some of the questions that have been coming in. Great. Thanks, for uh, David and, and Brad, for a great presentation. And we've left time for some Q&A as well, so perfect. Uh, first and foremost, for those of you who have asked about the slide deck and the recording, a copy of the slide deck and the recording will be delivered to you. Uh, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so if you guys are set, I'm going to kind of dive right in. Uh, for, for our audience, of course, you can use the Q&A uh, function on the dashboard to ask a question. So um, I'm going to start. David, I've got a couple questions, I think, for you as, as it relates to part of your portion of the presentation. Um, if okay. we do not if we do not contract dir directly with the CSP but through a third party, is it good enough to have a BAA with the third party with whom we are contracted? We have asked for and received copies of the third party provider's BAA with the CSP, but they, they use for our data. Hey, Carol. Well, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, and here's what the OCR has to say about that. The, the rule is, for anyone, if you create, maintain, receive, or transmit EPHI, you need to have a BA with the covered entity that is providing the EPHI. So if you do any of those four things, create, maintain, receive, or transmit, you are in fact a BAA, or excuse me, you are in fact a business associate, mm -hmm. regardless of whether you have a business associate agreement. And so it's really incumbent on that cloud service provider, if they know that they have are maintaining EPHI that comes from you that they have an agreement in place. So the answer is yes, they, they need to have a BA. Okay. Let me, let me hey, this, is, this is Brad Carroll. I think um, if I'm understanding the question properly, it's does the downstream provider have to provide a BAA to the covered entity? And I believe the answer is it's sort of daisy chains down, meaning if, 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 if you have a BAA with a provider and then they have a BAA with somebody else, that chain needs to com be complete. I don't believe that that third person needs to have provide the BAA to that covered entity because that's implied by that first BAA. Everybody needs to have one, but I don't believe it, they, that that end provider needs to provide one to all of the covered entities because that's being handled through that direct BAA. I hope I didn't confuse everybody with that. Okay, um, and somebody just sort of dovetailing on to this particular question, does this mean we have to have a BA with other doctor's offices? It, it depends on, on, I don't exactly understand the nature of the, you know, the, the question, who is asking the question and who has a, a BA with the doctor's office. It all comes down to, do you handle right. protected health information? Right. And whoever handles that information has to have a BA with whoever is providing the information to them, or they have to have a BAA with them. Right. Because right. they are, in fact, a BA, whether they have an agreement or not. Right. It's just the, the, uh, the acronym of BA is business associate. A BAA is a business associate agreement, right? <laughs> right. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, for the physical therapy facility uh, that you're yes. talking about, it, did the testimony – include the patient's information? That was it. Well, what, uh, yeah, it wasn't exactly about. testimony. Well, well, testimonials. So what they did was they took some, you know, some happy customers, um, and they put up the pictures of them and some information about, about that customer. And 
whatever they put up the, on their website was without having a, a signed written consent form from the customer, that is a violation of HIPAA privacy rules. Okay. And, and the OCR is especially concerned that when you put something on the web, it's there forever. Now, because the question was asked to them, what about a doctor's office where I put up, you know, or a dentist's office, you know, we got people with their nice smiles, pictures up on the wall, you'll see that. Um, they would say, well, as long as it's in a controlled area, as long as you have permission from the customer and it's in a controlled access area. But they really don't like it when it goes up on the web, because once something's up on the web, it's there forever. You can pull it down, but those pictures could still be floating around. So they take that very seriously. Okay. Uh, we got some clarification from uh, the, the previous asker. It, it, is, it is a provider. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably a specialist. If, if we receive and send in exchange EPHI with a primary care physician, does the, special, does the specialist and the PCP need a BA agreement? I actually all the all the all the events we've done together, I don't you know, on this topic, I don't think anybody's ever asked that question before. Right. Well I would go again to to, to Brad's, you know, the cha sort of chain of custody of mm -hmm. the information. Right. But anybody who handles that information is a BA is a BA. Right. They're a business associate associate, regardless of whether they have an agreement. Right. So right. let's I, I I think we should follow up on that one because yeah. I can't imagine every doctor in a you know who deals with 50 other doctors having signed BAAs with 50 other doctors. Uh, so let's we can follow back up an email on that particular question. Yeah, yeah, we've got some we've got some uh, we've got some providers emailing in, and so I think I think um, like I said, all the events that we've done together, I don't think anybody's ever brought that question to the to the table, so that's that's kind of interesting. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, we shall we shall we shall we shall we shall find out the answer, and maybe we can um, you know put that in um, a follow up email with the recording in the in the slide deck. Um, isn't encryption an addressable require addressable in quotation marks uh, requirement because a, a covered entity theoretically doesn't have to encrypt if they aren't sending data over the internet? So it is, it is considered addressable, but remember what the, we said during the webinar that uh, OCR says addressable is your baseline. You need to encrypt. So it's 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 presented in a, I would say, an interesting way. If you're not encrypting, you need to document why you're not encrypting, and then you have to document what steps you're taking to ensure the security of that data. So uh, as we've because this is one that we've talked about uh, and hashed over many times. Yeah. The effort, the effort it would take to protect the data in some alternative way, never seems more beneficial than just encrypting. So if you don't encrypt, you're really putting your, yourself at risk, uh, even if it is addressable. Right. Um, I would just add to that that, that that you know they say they're talking about data in motion over the internet. Um, but there's also, you know, data that's at rest if it's on a laptop or a thumb drive. And there also it should be encrypted. So it's not just when it's going over the over the internet. Okay. Uh, how would you tell if your email is a secure email for ePHI? Uh, well, there's a, a couple of ways. Um, one, you might know that your particular email system uh, is set up in such a way that it is uh, uh, it is secure. It is using TLS and uh, the proper encryption. Uh, so if you're using Outlook or Exchange, uh, your IT administrator would tell you that. The other is if you're using something like Gmail, different email programs indicate uh, whether or not uh, an email is encrypted. I think Gmail this past year started putting little locks up in the header of the message to tell you the yes, state of did. that uh, mm -hmm. uh, of that uh, that email. So the thing to remember is if you are using something that is uh, where you're not managing it, where it's cloud based, you need to make sure that that uh, encrypted connection is not optional. It has to be a forced encryption because many email systems will encrypt if they can, and then if they can't, they just fall back to not being encrypted. And you need to make sure that that particular feature is disabled. 
Um, yes, I would just add that, yeah. that that's a very important point, the, the forced nature of TLS encryption as opposed to opportunistic, whereas if, if they can encrypt, they will, but if they don't, they'll just send it in the clear. I think that's the way Gmail works. Uh, you know, those, those like public platforms. And, and eFax Corporate, for example, on our when faxes are sent as email attachments, they must be encrypted, and if they, if they don't, it doesn't send. It, it's mandatory. So that's what, that's what forced TLS means. Okay. Uh, well, are old-fashioned fax machines considered compliant if they're located in a secure area? Well, as long as you have rules. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, secure. In, in my head, I'm going behind a locked door. I mean, I'm just trying to think of. Like <laughs> yeah. If if it's all about comp like compliance around the access to it. So if it's mm -hmm. in a secure area, and the people who have access to that secure area understand what's required of them under HIPAA, then you're good. It's uh, it's when they're Anybody can get access to that room, or they're taking the papers out of the room and then leaving them on a desk. Right. You know, it's all about managing uh, uh, managing that data and making sure that you're following the rules. And, and, and I would I would just add that it's it's you know a fax machine's not compliant or non-compliant. It's it's a piece of technology. It's how it's used. And, and as Brad pointed out, what kind of access controls are in place? And does everybody? Who enters that secure area are is, are they authorized to view EPHI? Right, right. And how many times have you been in a doctor's office where the fax machine is just sitting right in the front desk area? You know what I mean? Just in a open open space. Sure, right. And in small small office like that, it can be difficult. But you know, what about the people who who clean up after hours? You know, or back there dusting? Are they authorized to view EPHI? Right, right. So. All right, we've got time for one more question, and then uh, we will have to we will have to we will have to wrap this up. Um, if if we have someone, a business associate, sending information to us encrypted or via text, what is our responsibility, or is it our or is it our compliance only specific to our to our entity? Well, I, I, I could take uh, tackle that to, to start with. I, I mentioned that in, in the uh, yeah. presentation. So they, they refer to that as vicarious responsibility, and you are responsible if your if your business associate is doing things that would be a violation of HIPAA. You, as a covered entity, are responsible. It, it's not just on them; it flows through to you. So that's part of what the business associate agreement and the service level agreement that goes along with that is supposed to detail and spell out how you communicate information and how you don't. So, right, so if somebody does the answer, because we've had similar questions before, you need to communicate to that person not to do that again. And if they do, uh, then you need to address it. Okay, right, right. All right, well, Great presentation, guys. We appreciate it. And of course, I think we'll be doing another event in the coming months. Just to remind everybody who's sort of uh, asked a question and chatted in, we will get the slide deck and the recording out to you uh, for your use. And uh, I hope everybody has a great weekend, and we'll see you on the next event. Thank you, Carol. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Bye.